Good evening and welcome to everybody here at St. Mary's this evening and for those joining on uh, Zoom or YouTube, we're grateful for you to be able to join us. It's exciting to have you here after a few years hiatus due to our friend COVID, um, but we're glad you're here tonight. My name is Lindsay and I have the privilege of serving as the rector of this parish. Um, a few notes just for those here to make yourselves more comfortable with this space. Um, accessible washrooms can be found down the hallway to the left and right. And if you need um, assisted hearing devices, they can be um, located in the back um, by the sound booth. Also like to just take a moment to acknowledge that these lands which we gather on here are the unceded ancestral lands of the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish uh, First Nations. For a number of years, St. Mary's has had the honor of hosting Vancouver School of Theology's Summer Public Lecture, and tonight we are very grateful for the opportunity to do so in person yet again. And with that, I'd like to welcome the Re Reverend Dr. Richard Topping, Principal of VST, to offer a few remarks and to welcome our speaker for this evening. Thank you, Lindsay, for your warm welcome and for the partnership with St. Mary's in this annual Visiting Distinguished Scholars program, uh, funded generously by a member of this congregation. Uh, this program brings a scholar of international repute to both teach a course and give a lecture in the VST summer school program, and we're so glad for this. It's my pleasure to introduce this year's uh, Visiting Distinguished Scholar. Uh, this is the second time I've had the chance of welcoming her in the recent past. Dr. Janet Soskis is William K. Warren, Distinguished Research Professor of Catholic Theology at Duke Divinity School. Her academic work lies at the intersection of Christian theology and philosophy. She's been particularly interested in questions of language and method and the doctrine of God. Her present project bring these interests together around the theme of naming God. For over 30 years, Professor Soskis was on the Faculty of Divinity at the University of Cambridge, where she is Professor Emerita of Philosophical Theology. She is a fellow emerita and past president of Jesus College Cambridge. Her books include Metaphor and Religious Language, The Kindness of God, and she is the joint editor of Creation and the God of Abraham. Her book, Sisters of Sinai, how Two Ladies Adventurers Discovered the Lost Gospels was read as Book of the Week on BBC Four and was in the Best Book of the Year lists of the Washington Post and the Christian Science Monitor. Dr. Soskis is past president of both the Catholic Theological Association of Great Britain and the Society for the Study of Theology. She has been a Eugene McCarthy visiting professor at the Gregorian University in Rome and president of the Cambridge University Catholic Association. She is a member of the English and Welsh uh, Anglican Roman Catholic Committee, and she takes part in Christian Muslim dialogue. Uh, the last bit is important. Dr. Soskis was born in Canada, in Vancouver, in the West even, and she has become a friend of the school. We're so pleased she's here with us this evening, especially because this is the first public lecture that we've had at VST in over two and a half years, and we're so glad that she's here to give it. She's going to address the question tonight, who am I, self-love, in the days of self-obsession. Welcome, Janet. Uh, thank you very much, Richard, for that uh, generous invitation, and thank you all for for being here, and, and a special thanks to St. Mary's and to the anonymous benefactor that's made this possible. It is wonderful to, to be here, really wonderful to be here, um, to be as the, in, in this distinguished scholar position. As, as Richard has said, I, I have come full circle. I was born in Vancouver General. Um, my father was just finishing off his degree at UBC as a mature student, and although I spent, grew up in the in, in West Kootenays. Um, but I came back for a year um, uh, as a student at Regent um, and uh, before studying in England. But that's enough about me. I'm already self-obsessed. You see how easy it is to get into this. <laughs> Can I be heard by everyone? Is it audible? All right for the recording? Okay, good. Um, and I, I'm very delighted, pleased to be back again at uh, VST. I'm really thrilled um, about the encouragement of theology and theological reflection in Vancouver. Uh, and uh, it means a lot to me. 
And it was really a statement of Richard's that prompted my title. I don't know whether he'll regret this or not, but <clears throat> um, VST is coming out with a nice volume. Is it out yet of essays? It's out. I haven't seen it yet. Okay. Um, essays on theological formation by the various um, faculty, the very distinguished faculty that there is now at VST. And, um, and I was asked to write a little afterward for that volume. And, and Richard had written, I think, one of the forewords in which he said, talking about the need for such a volume and the importance of theological study at this time, he said, <clears throat> we live in a time when six of the seven deadly sins are medical conditions and the pride is considered a virtue. <laughs> And uh, I, I thought, oh, that really just struck a note with me. Um, and I remember thinking about that. I, I remember seeing a cartoon of a bunch of monks walking along in a parade in habits, and they were carrying a banner that said, proud to be humble, you know. <laughs> um, so who, who am I, uh, self-love in the days of self-obsession? Well, what do I mean by self-obsession? Um, it is not the same as self-centeredness, which uh, is, is uh, more disastrous, but you could say that self-obsession is much more of a besetting sin of Western modernity, um, if we think of sin as whatever it is that takes us away from God. Because most of us, I reckon, and I do include myself in this, find ourselves in a persistent ricochet of self-deprecation and self-indulgence. And it goes something like this, you know, that waking up in the night. I haven't read the complete works of Shakespeare. I haven't gone down the Nile. I haven't learned Spanish. I haven't kept up with Duolingo. I haven't gone to the gym. I haven't learned French. I haven't sent enough Christmas cards. I haven't saved enough. I haven't given enough away. I think a special BC one would be, I haven't traveled enough, because no one in BC seems to quite travel enough. And of course, we can add special Christian versions of this. I haven't prayed enough. I haven't visited prisoners, given to widows. And all of these are likely to be true. But it strikes me that a common feature of this is the I and the enough. Um, I and the enough. I rem it reminded, um, when my uh, daughter was just uh, two years old, it was a long time ago, we were visiting her aunt, and this two-year-old who was barely speaking was weeping and clung on to the knee of her aunt and sobbed, and she said, I want, I want, I want enough. And her aunt said, oh, Catherine, that's the cry of the 20th century. <laughs> so it starts, very early on. But self-love, what is self-love? It's hard, I think, to love yourself. But let me remind you, since it is a theology lecture, of some of the words of Jesus, and it's the dominical command that you, when asked what the greatest commandment was, you love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength, and the second is like under it to love your neighbor as yourself. There's no greater commandment than these. That's Mark's version. Now, this is the dominical command, and you'll find, I, I often say when I'm, the course I'm teaching at VST is around this, star, this stepping off point, is this particular scriptural <clears throat> teaching was, of course, based on teaching from the Hebrew Bible. Uh, and people will say, um, ah, yes, love God and love your neighbor. But that's not actually what it says. It says, love God and love your neighbor as yourself. And it was Augustine's great sagacity to notice that by implication, you can't love your neighbor if you don't love yourself. But we are less good in the Christian teacher, church at teaching people how properly to love themselves. In fact, it's a kind of vexatious subject. Augustine did address this in his early treatise on Christian teaching, which he wrote at about the same time as he was writing his Confessions. And he tried to think about the whole question of uh, if you love God with all your heart and all your soul, all your might, um, how, how does that work? Do you love God more 
than you love your husband or your wife if you're married, uh, do, do more than your children. He was trying to think through these um, dimensions and that kind of, he didn't quite resolve all these things, so you get subsequently through the centuries many reflections. Aquinas is still kind of reflect, ironing out the bumps, you might say, in Augustine's reflections on this. But one of the things that Augustine says in this text is that um, certain kind of self-love is, is evident. No one, he says, hates their own body. Um, and my experience when I'm teaching this text with undergraduates, whether they're in the UK uh, or at Duke, is they immediately set up, yes, we all hate our own bodies. I mean, not just the women say that, but the men. They, they, um, everyone knows how to hate their body. It's not athletic enough, or it's not slim enough, or it's too slim. Um, you know, uh, they find it very easy to hate their own body. Now, what Augustine was getting at is um, he thinks it's just an animal nature, like a cat will try to preserve all nine of its lives. Um, and no, no one would voluntarily uh, wound themselves. But I don't know if that's so true, but certainly it's not true. It's not self-evident evident to a lot of us that you can't hate your own body. But how can we, how do we love ourselves? Um, this consideration of trauma over how to deal with oneself is not new. So again, Augustine writing in the late fourth century, writing his confessions in, in a small town in North Africa, um, it talks about having terrific turmoil after, um, this is long before he became a Christian, which was only in his late 30s, or became actively Christian. He writes about his turmoil after the <clears throat> death of a young friend, um, and he went into a deep depression after this, and he, he says in that, I had become a vast problem to myself. He's already um, speaking of a situation that we perhaps recognize. And that, I think, is perhaps it was, it was a depression. As I've said, long before he became a Christian or actively Christian. And he des describes later at a different stage in his life. He'd gone, he'd migrated from North Africa um, because he was first teaching in a small town, then he was teaching in Carthage and then they weren't, students weren't paying, so he went to Rome where the students still didn't pay. Um, so he took a, a, a provincial appointment in Milan, and Milan was at that time the capital of the Western Roman Empire. So he was, he was as an experienced uh, rhetorician in a prime position. Um, he, was, he had connections all through, through the elite, the elite, um, uh, were um, members of a cult that he was a member of, the Manichaeans, or he had an affinity with. And so he, he'd really, he'd, he knew a lot of influential people. And to, we might think of uh, a rhetorician at that time would be like a, a really top-notch barrister or a lawyer of some sort. So he was sort of singled out for um, important things. You might go on from a position like that to become a governor of a province, say Spain, uh, and which would make you very, very rich indeed. So. He was moving on through things pretty quickly, but he was having trouble with himself. He had um, met, uh, heard the preaching of the Bishop Ambrose in Milan, and it, it taught him to how to read the Bible. And he um, was wanting very much to find a way to become a Christian, but he wanted to do it through ratiocination. He was trying to figure out what he had to do, what hoop he had to jump through. And he was really sort of appalled that lots of fairly ordinary people were finding their way into Christianity. And he, uh, with his immense um, wisdom and knowledge, uh, he was never shy about that, um, w wasn't getting there. Um, so he was walking around with friends. One of my students from the class today pointed out that a nice thing about the Confessions is he's, it's, it's, it's about a journey, his journey to understanding and to embracing Christian faith. But he's never alone. He's always talking to friends. And he's always learning things from friends. Um, uh, as you know, the whole thing is written as an extended prayer. It's written as an extended prayer. So ostensibly, the audience is God. But for the first 40 years, he's describing himself. And he says, and this you knew, O God. And this you knew, O God. But at the time, Augustine himself did not know God. And this, at this section of his life, it's in his 30s, he's in, he's 
profiled up for something really important, and he's preparing a panegyric on, on the emperor. So this is a very important public speech. And he says, in the course of it, I would tell numerous lies, and for my mendacity would win the good opinion of people who knew it to be untrue. Now, I've thought about this recently um, with a certain amount of certain politicians, um, how willingly one can tell lies and be awarded for mendacity. Uh, but he said that he was a bundle of anxieties and fears. So he and his friend, they're walking along in Milan, and they pass a beggar who's already drunk, and he's joking and laughing and asking them for coins. And uh, you know, he reaches in his pocket to give, give him some coins, and his friends say, don't do that. You know, he'll just spend it on drink. And, and Augustine says, well, that's what we're going to spend it on. You know? and, and he says that um, he's complaining about the speech he has to give. He says, I'm going to give this horrible speech in which I'll lie to get to the state of happiness that the beggars receive by just getting a few coins and getting drunk. And his friends try to reason with him that, you know, yes, but your glory will be the real thing. You'll have delivered a speech before the emperor. And, and Augustine says, well, just as the drunken beggar's glory wasn't the real thing, so mine won't be either. So it's really, he was troubled. He said, um, um, I'd become a problem to myself. Another thing he expressed, he's sort of, existential angst, you could say, which is, again, not new. I think of St. Paul in Romans. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do, and, but I hate what I do. So there's a, um, a large footprint for this kind of thought. And <clears throat> I have come to think that the um, Delphic injunction, know thyself, is one of the world's pe most dispiriting advice, know thyself. It's really depressing, um, but fortunately, it's not a Christian admonition, as I'll go in to, um, to talk about. And let me take you to another classical state of confusion about the self, which happens at, at the beginning of Dante's uh, great work, The Divine Comedy. And that's another thing you can add to your guilt list. I haven't read the Divine Comedy, or I haven't read it in Latin, or I, it's in, and pardon me, Italian, uh, or I haven't read it recently. It's always one more thing you can add to your haven't uh, done enough of. So <clears throat> it, it begins uh, famously, and I'll try it in Italian just because it, it seems such a shame not to, although I will probably, if any of you knew Italian, um, can say it much better. Nel mezzo del cammino de nostra vita mi ritrovai per una salva scura che la dritta via era smarita, which uh, is to say, at the middle point on the path of our life, I came round to myself and found myself now searching through a dark, dark wood, the right way blurred and lost. So Dante famously begins this by saying not in the middle of the way of my life, um, but in the middle of the way of our life. And that's the inauguration into the comedy for us, because his journey is his own individual journey, but he's written it as a journey for all of us. Dante, at the time, as you may recall, he'd been exiled. He was a political exile, unjustly, he thought, from his beloved Florence. He was never to return to it. He was a refugee. He was sleeping on people's couches, as it were. And, uh, uh, and yet he writes this wonderful piece about, um, really about the seven deadly sins in many ways, uh, but it begins by uh, a way that inducts us all into the journey that he, Dante, is taking in the middle of the way of our lives. I found myself in a dark wood, the right way, being lost. So there's nothing new in a sense of this needing to find oneself in that sense, but there is something new. There's something new that happens in Western modernity that philosophers have written about a great deal, and how Western modernity has become almost uniquely uh, self-obsessed and individualistic. We have become a problem to ourselves, so it's not just that I individually might have a uh, become a problem to myself, uh, as might Augustine or Dante. But we, in a sense, we collectively have become a problem to ourselves. What have we done 
to our communities? What have we done to our environment? What have we done to our political themes? We, we have become a problem to ourselves. And this is something um, on which, as I've said, philosophers have meditated. Something happens to man, capital M, and something happens to God. And I think those two things are connected, and I'd like to talk about that. So, of course, from the 16th century, um, we enter 16th, 17th, and 18th century, the, the vigor of the Enlightenment. It was a period in which people were anxious to move into scientific knowledge. They were anxious, particularly in the realm of the sciences, to get away from Aristotelian science, biology, to the move into the new empirical sciences, to cast away old traditions, um, uh, to move confidently into a, a room, a world whose parameters were determined by reason. And so enlightenment, the self-designation bears its own description, the, the age of light, coming into light, the age of reason is sometimes another, uh, versus, of course, the dark ages. Um, in this age of reason, man could become the measure of all things. And I'm using man, capital M, not to indicate male persons, although it was male persons at this time, but as a kind of philosophical stalking horse, really. And there was a philosophical transition that's been fairly well documented um, in the way we think about man and the way we think about God, a kind of reciprocity in this. Charles Taylor, um, probably one of the Canadian philosopher, of course, one of the most distinguished philosophers of the world, has written about this in two of his big books, The Sources of the Self and also The Secular Age. It's a kind of a tandem uh, account that Taylor, a Roman Catholic, a committed Roman Catholic, has written. Uh, but uh, a number of scholars, including um, the French philosopher Jean-Luc Marion, uh, see something happening quite specifically with Descartes. Um, and Marion is uh, initially a distinguished Descartes scholar. Uh, and Descartes famously was troubled by doubt, uh, and he went away and locked himself in a stove, which sounds uncomfortable, but actually he was giving tutorials in Sweden, and a stove was a kind of great heated uh, sauna-type room, and he tried to think his way out of, of doubt. How could he be certain of anything? And arrived famously at, uh, I think, therefore I am. Cogito ergo sum. And this was the starting point of his philosophy, and, and, and really of a lot of Western philosophy since then has been imbricated in this, um, this idea of starting from the certainty of the self. Because having started here, Descartes felt then he could then prove the existence of God. He first demonstrated that he, he knew himself to be a thinking self, so he knew that he existed, and then he could prove the existence of God um, uh, from, from his own self-identity. And he did this by identifying God as a perfect being uh, in contrast with himself. So he describes, he says, by God I mean the one who's infinite, eternal, immutable, omniscient, and omnipotent. And these were all perfections which Descartes himself lacked. So, you know, first, first me, then God. Um, and this, uh, this kind of definition of God was a new step. Previously, if people talked about, people didn't attempt to define God, and indeed it was the consensus of theologians that God couldn't be defined. Um, God couldn't be defined because God wasn't a creature like we are creatures, so one couldn't come to a definition of God. But now we have a definition in terms of a small selection of predicates, um, infinite, eternal, immutable, omnipotent, um, which came to be called attributes, divine attributes, and sometimes called the classical attributes. If you've done philosophy of religion 101, that's what you'll, you know, you'll, you'll study. And that same subsection uh, we find in Locke and Hobbes and Hume and the successors in modern philosophy of religion. Now, in the Age of Enlightenment, this um, putative ability to define God by reason alone and to not use scripture was considered to be quite an advantage because um, there were, after all, um, Europe had come out of wars of religion, and it was felt if you could go back to just reason and demonstrate this out of pure rationality, then you could all agree on that, and you wouldn't have to go back to anything as murky as scripture. So you can see what the attraction was. But what, in fact, it led to 
um, was a rise in, in deism, because what kind of God can be proved by reason alone? It is this um, rather spectral um, philosophical God um, demonstrated by reason, uh, infinite, eternal, omniscient, immutable. It didn't seem to be a God anyone could worship. Nonetheless, in the 18th century, the rationalist philosophers, very confident in the powers of reason, um, liked this God because they thought this God was quite a bit like them, um, because they were rational and this God was rational. So what's not to like? Um, God was made in the image of man, as perhaps always. And uh, so some philosophers in the 18th century argued that on the question of certainty, there, we can know certain things just as certainly as God knows them. What things? Well, truths of pure mathematics. Now you might say that in lived, lives, in lived life, the truths of pure mathematics aren't really as important as knowing whether your husband loves you or perhaps something like that, or even whether your dog loves you. But uh, nonetheless, that was a a little bit of a, you might say, overweening, understanding that God's, God's intellect is just like ours. Now, you might see that although that's rather abstract, pure mathematics, there's an anthropocentrism that's going there, that God is modeled on the human being, just bumped up. So rather than Descartes as well, God, God is um, powerful, so, but a bit more powerful means, so let's put it in omnipotent so as not to hurt God's feelings. God knows things, but a little bit better than I do, so bump it up to omniscient. And indeed, once we get to a philosopher like Hume, who is the first really skeptical philosopher, this is precisely what he says has happened, that everyone's just taken, he, he, he doesn't, uh, Hume couldn't quite say he didn't believe in God because he'd be run out of Edinburgh on a rail. It was not ex socially acceptable in Britain to be agnostic or atheist, um, but he, he could say that this is just, they've taken all the features we admire in a man and just bump them up into kind of servile admiration. Um, we don't like change, so God's immutable, that kind of thing. Well, um, a God uh, like this, uh, whatever the initial attractions, turned out to be quite a malign influence because it was easy, and this is part of what Hume was saying, this is just a big guy in the sky. And that is the whole basis of Richard Dawkins' immense wealth from having written books about it. You know, the Christians just worship this big guy in the sky. It's simply a projection. Feuerbach, others say this, um, a kind of wizard of Oz up there, and completely unconvincing. Uh, no, seemingly, even if you believed in the big guy in the sky, there's a lot of problems that arise. If why isn't this, why if God could perform miracles, why, why God didn't st stop the Holocaust, and so on. So. In the end, a lot of people decided that, like Laplace, uh, I have no need of that hypothesis. And we entered a secular age, which we take in the West, perhaps, even those of us who are church going, as um, just an obvious progression. And we think, well, surely it's, it's the natural way. And people in benighted areas of the world, like Africa, where the Christian church is growing, or Indonesia, where the Christian church is going, um, they just haven't learned what we in the secular West know, that we don't need God anymore. But we are the exceptions. We are the exceptions. And there's something about Western modernity that, that for better, for worse, has made us move in this direction. Now, I, I, I wish to say there are many um, benefits of the Enlightenment. I don't want, and there's certainly many benefits of modern science and these things going together. I'm no, in no way um, saying that that's not true. As a woman, I'm enormously grateful to all the benefits of the en Enlightenment. Uh, but nonetheless, um, could we not have gone through into a number of Enlightenment views about the dignity of human beings without feeling that we can only raise God, human beings up without putting God down as though it's a zero-sum game, which is rather the way Hume had presented it, that the, the more God goes up, the more human beings go down. So, you know, greatly exalted God, servile human beings. And, and I think a number of people have sort of been taught that, thought that's what they'd heard in the pews. So maybe it's the case that we have presented a God that cannot be worshipped, certainly, that's what the philosopher Heidegger thought, uh, that we presented a God who is just steely and absent and, and a God that can't be worshipped, this God of the classical attributes.
But you know, if you look at back to Descartes and Descartes coming up with these string of attributes that are then seized upon, um, uh, Merrill points out that earlier reflection on this by theologians did not talk about attributes but divine names. And divine names were all taken from scripture and there were hundreds and hundreds of them. And they were used in liturgy, in chant, in um, lectionary readings. Um, so for instance, in the serum rite of the medieval English church, um, uh, uh, in the marriage service, the heavenly choir was invoked to proclaim the names of the most high God over the newly wedded couple. And there's a list far too long for me to give, but here's just a few. And you'll recognize some of these names. Messiah, Emmanuel, Firstborn, Alpha, Omega, Lamb, Serpent, Goat, Lion, Word, Worm, Splendor, Bridegroom. You know, all drawn from scriptures, chanted and sung, is played in song and polyphony, and deeply woven into the worship of, uh, of the faithful. Now you can see at once that names are different from attributes. Attributes suggest qualities God has. So if God is omnipotent, that's sort of like saying God has red hair or a 10-speed bicycle, something God has. Where names, what are names for? You have to see what names do. In, uh, names are not just designations. Names are the means by which we call upon someone. Names are the means by which we summon someone, we plead, we address. All these names, many of them are taken from the Psalter. All these names of God are names in which people are, be, are in relation with God, just as we are in relation with one another through names. So uh, for instance, names to just designate an individual. Anyone can designate me by calling me Janet or Janet Soskis, but only two people can designate me by calling me mum. So names have a particularity and indicate relationship. And, and that's true in the Hebrew Bible. They indicate a whole um, tessellations of relationships through the Asia of the people of Israel as they learn and meditate on who their God was. Because um, famously, uh, the God of the Hebrew Bible has a proper name, the Tetragrammaton, which um, sometimes Christians vocalize as Yahweh. Jews would never vocalize it, and I try not to. Uh, but it, isn't, it, isn't, it doesn't mean God, and then Hebrew has another word for God. It is a proper name for God, like Philbert or Jim. It's a proper name for God, but it was never vocalized, and it still isn't vocalized by um, Jews. They don't use the name, and so many other names were used, these plethora of other names, like Alpha and Omega, uh, Emmanuel, these are all names from the Hebrew Bible that we use in the New Testament to designate Christ. So then these names embed the Christian understanding, not just in scripture, but in a whole history of a people, in a whole history of relationships um, and coming to understand of the people of Israel that uh, the, the church finds itself standing within. Um, uh, and, uh, that's rather difficult, different from the attributes. Mind you, those attributes, infinite, eternal, immutable, are also in the Bible. They are also biblical names. I'm not saying they shouldn't be used. It wasn't these particular names that was wrong. But the, the idea of uh, being able to delineate God, especially delineate the divine essence by means of the attributes, this was a new step and not a God to whom one could pray. So it's no wonder then that God has become a superfluous hypothesis. But what have we lost when we lost God? I mean, already this is anticipated by someone like Nietzsche when he talks about the death of God, uh, who gave us the sponge to walk out the horizon. If, if you blot out God, things happen to, to man. There's a cost. If we begin with the self and prove everything else outside, um, one thing Charles Taylor has pointed out is the man of reason, this Cartesian figure, gains certainty only by distancing himself from all that is own. So he, he makes the cogito as if locked in into the med mental world, and the world out there is, is sort of like the world on a screen. So it's like we're brains on sticks, gazing out at the world from which we increasingly feel alienated. And this 
feeling that we're isolated, isolated rationational agents um, in a world that is something other than us, that we're not connected to, it seems to be something that happens in Western modernity. I'm not saying that philosophy, of course, and Descartes was the only reason that it happens, but it was a convenient philosophy for the age of empire. Um, and, and some uh, Descartes sort of radical subjectivity made a radical objectivity possible. The man of reason, um, and you might say whose reason, but the man of reason, self-determined by Western modernity, could determine because um, this man of reason, capital M, capital R, could determine what was best for everyone, could determine who men of reason were, for instance, not women, or not sub-Saharan Africans who could be sold into slavery because um, they weren't men of reason. This, this rational philosophy had very unpleasant consequences. And the same kind of Western individualism, although it was generative, perhaps we could say, of a great deal of energy and exploration, was ended up being highly destructive of the world we have around us, um, of the environment. Again, I have a certain amount of difficulty even with the term environment, because whose environment? That too is sort of predicated on our environment, I mean, our human being. I hope we would broaden it out to think it's the environment for <clears throat> sloths and slow worms, but you know, our environments, it seems to imply, the environment for us. So the, in a sense, you might say, <clears throat> It's arguable anyway, and I think Charles Taylor suggests this, that the secularization of the modern West is sort of like left us as sort of cosmological orphans. We're somehow outsiders to the world, which we fear we callously exploit nonetheless. So there's a double valence to who am I. There's the who am I that might be the, the question that St. Paul had or Augustine or, or Dante, but there's also the who are we who is the human race? How do we think about what it means to be human today in this secular age? How do we fit in the order of things? Or is there even an order of things? Can we talk about that? Um, the default position of Western modernity and what one sees all the time on the BBC and probably on the CBC, if I were watching it more, is um, materialism. Um, a Western materialism. This is just accepted as standard mental hygiene, by which I don't mean um, everyone should be uh, trying to buy themselves a Lamborghini. Or I don't mean materialism in that sense. I just mean the idea that um, matter is all that is, all there is, and uh, we're just different concatenations of matter. Now, at one sense, that that is true, and I don't want to dispute as a Christian that we, we are fully physical, we are fully material, objects, but of course, as a Christian, I wouldn't say that matter is all there is. There's also God, <laughs> and God is not a material being. Um, God is, in Christianity, the creator of all that is, including all, all matter, all space, all time. Um, and, you know, that's, um, it's not self-evident that there's matter is all there is. That, I hasten to say, is a metaphysical thesis. It's not a scientific thesis. It, it's put about as though it were a proof of modern science. It's not a proof of modern science. It's a, it's a position statement. But it's no more self-evident than thinking that there would be a creator. Um, what is self-evident, perhaps you could say, is we don't know. But you can't say it's self-evident that there only matter. That is a philosophical claim. So who are we? Um, and I think this um, results in a certain amount of dislocation that I've seen, I've seen among students for quite some time. The sense that you, uh, you had the sense that people can no longer see their lives as ordered, as ordered towards the good. That's sort of dispersed. And I found a statement of this in the, the very distinguished philosopher Thomas Nagel, who is not a religious person but formulates, I think, what is a very familiar sense of anxiety in an essay entitled Secular Philosophy and the Religious Temperament. And there he observes that religions uh, variously uh, offer, and characteristically, 
offer some understanding about the relationship of individual life to the universe as a whole. That's part of what they do, anchor you in the whole. Um, but how, he asks, can this be done in the secular world? How can one bring, bring one's, into one's individual life a recognition of one's relationship to the universe as a whole, whatever one's relation is? The dismal fact is you just think of yourself as a collocation of kind of hydrocarbons that could be in any number of collocations. And that's not a happy way to think about yourself or your loved ones. And it's certainly not a happy way to think about other human beings. Because in the end, if you're only thinking of yourself as a material, a random connection of subatomic particles, then what is a human being at all? And there, this can lead to a kind of dissolution of the idea of a human being altogether. Um, there's a productive side to this, but a very unproductive side too. So, Nagel asks, how can one be, bring one in, one's individual, into one's individual life a recognition of one's relationship to the universe as a whole? This is not, he continues, just an expression of curiosity, but a question of attitude. Is there a way, he says, to live in harmony with the universe and not just in it? There you find the whole idea of gazing at the world, but somehow on the outside, um, and the outside looking in. So in Nagel, we see <clears throat> both the individual question, who am I? and the collective who are we coming together in an alienation that's both painful and destructive. If we um, turn back um, then, uh, we have to see that we've become forgetful even in our churches uh, of who we are and particularly in our churches we should know that we are creatures, that this is a primordial definition of who we are, we are creatures. And why we should say that is because the very term implies a creator. And again, a lot of language of creation is thrown about glibly by people these days without realizing that if you speak about creation, it implies a creator. Of course, that's intrinsic to the Christian, Jewish, and Muslim understanding in speaking about creatures and creator. And we do need to escape from what you might say the, uh, the Western arrogance of recent centuries, from thinking of ourselves as the center of the universe, which you might say a lot of um, theology in early modernity did. Um, for instance, a lot of 19th century natural theology and proofs for the existence of God talked about sermons in stone. Even uh, the idea, for instance, when um, Darwinism was controversial and people were digging up dinosaur bones, there was the idea that God might have hidden dinosaur bones, you know, since the world was only a few thousand years old, according to the Bible, to test our faith, God hid dinosaur bones in the rocks um, so that we would find them, and other kinds of sermons and stones. Now, the kind of worrying thing about the language of sermons and stones is that, you know, God doesn't care at all about the stones, right, or about the dinosaurs. They're just a sort of prop and for my spiritual development, you know, so God can preach to us. Well, couldn't God preach to us another way other than by killing the dinosaurs and concealing their bones? Um, it's, there was a certain amount of, uh, if you look at the reception and the hostility towards uh, Darwinism in the early days, there was a great deal of resistance to the suggestion that human beings were animals. People found this offensive. They found it morally offensive that we were animals, you know, like particularly like monkeys, and it's sexually disgusting and so on. Uh, but what else are we supposed to be if we're not animals, right? So um, would it have been better if we said we're, we're creatures? Could you have denied that? That you know, we surely are creatures, just as a slow worm is a creature and a sloth is a creature. We are creatures, and uh, uh, we're not God. But yet somehow a lot of kind of theology in early modernity so poised us as in the image of God, somewhere between God and all those other things that are there sort of really for our benefit and use, and let's get on with it. Now, I, I hasten to say that this hasn't been the way it's always been, and it isn't the way it is everywhere in the world. Um, previous generations did understand their lives in the round as oriented towards the good, and not just Christians, but Jews and Muslims, and of course, many different kinds of ancient philosophers, understood there to be a unity between the moral life 
uh, biological life, ethics, and human flourishing. That what it is to be truly alive is to seek the good. And that's what we, like all other creatures, do. We naturally seek the good, the source of our, our life. Uh, Richard was reminding me of an image I once used of a, a sunflower uh, for seeking the good, that um, um, all living things, so a sunflower will seek the sun, famously turns towards the sun. Um, we, of course, have free will, so we don't always turn towards the sun in our own sense. The sunflower is naturally turning towards the source of its life. If a sunflower that had free will said, okay, the sun's well enough, but I'd rather live in a basement in a garage or something, no windows, I'm tired of the sun, that sunflower would have a short life. But of course, we, as free agents, can make this kind of decision. We can choose, thinking we're choosing the good, we can choose things that aren't good for us. And this is why the brand of philosophy called uh, virtue ethics concentrates on formation in desiring the good. So it's not the desire is wrong. We des the desire is good. We desire what we think is good for us, but we're mistaken in uh, what we desire. And these are big themes, um, for instance, in Dante's Divine Comedy. So uh, uh, this work, you know, I think it's 800 years of the anniversary of Dante's death. And as you will recall, um, after the dark wood, he's, um, Dante has sent a, a, an aid that his, um, some figures in heaven, female figures, send someone to assist him and guide him through a, a trip through um, hell, uh, purgatory, and a glimpse into paradise. And uh, surprisingly, the guide that's sent to take him through hell and um, through much of purgatory is the pagan philosopher Virgil. And it seems quite a deliberate. Now, Dante admired Virgil as a great poet, but also as a wise man. Because he, Dante, like St. Paul, thought it should be obvious to all people that there is a God and that our lives will be happy when they're oriented toward, towards this God. And he felt that his own life had been disordered. He wasn't only bemoaning the fact he'd been kicked out of Florence, uh, but that he did find he was, his own way was disordered, it was lost. And so <clears throat> he goes through these various stages of um, disorder. And the, there's a wonderful exposition of the seven deadly sins, and one I want to pick out because it's, uh, because Richard mentioned the seven deadly sins is, is that of gluttony. Because I think most people probably think of gluttony as perhaps charitably, um, perhaps uh, um, a medical condition. But um, gluttony in, in um, uh, the Commedia isn't associated necessarily with eating too much or drinking too much. There can be different kinds of gluttony. A gluttony, the gluttons he meets in Paradis, the Paradiso, who are many of them popes, they eat beyond hunger. But what do they do that for? They eat because of a fear they're going to miss something, a fear they have a lack that can never be met, and it can never be met by pouring food or drink into a body that's no longer hungry or thirsty. It's a fear of missing out. So they do not know what rightly they desire, and in purgatory they dis discover, according to Dante, that what they truly love is to be the body and the blood of Christ. So what nothing wrong with our desires, and Virgil has the strongest statement of this. Um, he gives the best description of rightly ordered desire in a little speech, where he says, our natural love can never go astray. Um, the other, though, may err when wrongly aimed, or else through too much vigor or the lack where mind, or the lack, where mind love sends itself on primal good and keeps in secondaries in due control, it cannot be the cause of false delight. Well, to decant that a little bit, our bodily desires, um, he says, can't, can't be wrong. They're not what is wrong. Uh, the disorder comes in because we haven't focused our desires on the primal good, which is the source of life itself, the sun for the sunflower, and God for all creatures, because all creatures have their life from God. So although Dante's given this script to Virgil, the pagan Virgil, it, it's um, uh, really a, a highly Christian speech, because he's put in it the doctrine of creation that Virgil wouldn't have known about, that all the world is made by and guided towards God, 
that all rightly ordered things, all life moves towards the good. Um, all things come from God and have their being only as God holds them continuously in being. We're all made by primal good in the terms of Virgil and long for that primal good. All our desiring actions are inflections of this life force within us, which is part of our animal nature, or in Christian terms, part of our creaturely nature. We desire the good, though reasoning creatures like human beings may mistake lesser shabby simulacrums for this good. And although much can be said of the differences of ethical systems around the world, it's easy to overlook the overwhelming consensus of uh, what we want. Children should be loved, parties and transactions should be honest. The wheels of life and of commerce wouldn't go round without such basics. But perhaps what we've lost, or so Charles Taylor thinks, is any sense of a shared anchorage for this. I don't mean by this, by any shared metaphysical anchorage, anything complex, but simply the idea that there is an order to the universe, uh, and a good life is ordered to that. Kant and other Enlightenment thinkers, having rejected any metaphysics, sought to establish everything, including ethical schemes, on pure reason with limited success. And some have argued there could be a biological grounding for our ethics, and that's a good way forward, not least because it allows within our moral framework some way of thinking about our obligations to the rest of the created order, sees us as part of that. But we need to find some way of understanding ourselves as integrated what, um, from a Christian or Jewish or Muslim point of view, we are animals, certainly. We certainly have our biological needs and dispositions, but over and all above this, we are creatures. And as creatures, we understand that our being and our, the entire cosmos is gift, all comes from God. I mean, this was something theologians in, in Augustine's time deliberated on. I mean, some some of the earlier thinkers thought that God couldn't possibly have created certain aspects of the world because of evil, but it was easily um, early decided upon that no, a Genesis said that God made the world and it was good. This is a, um, the, all the created order is, is one. Otherwise, you're getting in the equation some other power, perhaps the devil, or perhaps just powers of lethargy that tend towards evil. The Christians then can't avoid being at least minimally metaphysical insofar as we believe in a creator God and that all things, including space and time, have their being from this divine creator. Now, I want to caution to say that I'm not talking about creationism. Creationism, as it develops in the late 19th century and early 20th century, largely in the States, is a fairly modern notion. It is, this is the idea, the focus on the doctrine of creation on seven units of 24 hours. This has never been the classical teaching of Christianity. Augustine explicitly says in his literal commentary in Genesis that it, it couldn't possibly be seven units of 24 hours because the sun and the moon aren't even made till the third or fourth day, right? So it can't be that. And also Augustine says, anyway, the animals, they're so complicated, they must have been made by little seeds and grown up over a long period of time. We're not the first people to think this, although I'm not saying that Augustine had a completely scientific understanding of that. But they certainly understood that the book of Genesis was to be read figuratively. And the doctrine of creation that is in the early teaching of the church and in the creed is that God, we believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and of all that is visible and invisible. So that means angels as well. We've lost a lot when we lost the angels. But all that is, is created by God, and of course, this includes space and time. So creation isn't something that happened a long time ago and far away, and God's just spending the rest of, rest of creation sort of playing billiards in the back room with a few friends. That's not how it works. So as I saw a wonderful visual aid, a uh, speaker was saying, uh, creation, creation is not like this. World, you know, God. Creation is like this like this, because if God, as God creates space and time, were God not creating the world at every microsecond, nothing would be. God is not far away from us at the beginning of time. God is now. 
Creation ex nihilo, the Christian doctrine of creation, means that God is utterly present to everything in particular at every moment. This was the big turning point in Augustine that allowed him to write his confessions. God is every space, every time. And those are the true meanings of God's omniscience, omnipotence. They're not God that God is far, but God is nearer to me, nearer to me than my own heartbeat, as Augustine said, and much later than him, uh, John Henry Newman. So that's the doctrine of creation, that now God's creation is now. So um, getting back to how can we love ourselves, um, remind you again of the dominical commands, the dominical command to love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength, and the second is like unto it to love your neighbor as yourself. There's no greater uh, commandment than these. So how do we do that? Augustine again. Well, you should love yourself as you are loved and known by God, and that is as a beloved creature. And your neighbor is also God's beloved creature. And so too, we can extend that to other beloved creatures, that love does not have to be small and exclusive. It can fan out to all the created order. But the grounding of it is, as it were, to love God first and have those other loves filtered back to us and given back to us again through the love of God. And that is why the love that a mother has for her child or the love that a, a, a husband has for his wife doesn't derogate from the love that that person has for God. In fact, it's the love for God that, in a rightly ordered life, frees those human lives, loves from being too possessive, too dominating, too clinging, too destructive. I mean, I'm not saying this is easy, but this is, this is what the ordering should be, uh, that this love of God, where we understand all of us uh, as creatures in this integrated and ordered whole. Well, as for the antique dictum, the Delphic Oracle, know thyself, well, good luck to you is all I can say. St. Paul didn't think he could do it. Augustine was sure he couldn't. <coughs> Augustine said, um, from the very fact that we don't even understand who we are, we can only imagine how much we don't understand what God is, right? This may not seem very encouraging to you, but Augustine never tires of saying that what God is in God's self, we shall never know, at least not in this life. We can't define God. We can't put God in a box. God is not a creature. God is not six foot tall with a 10-speed bicycle. We can't define God. In the De Trinitate, he says a wonderful thing. He's citing Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, and he says, if anybody thinks, he's sort of paraphrasing Paul's letter, if anybody thinks he knows anything, he does not yet know as he ought to know. But if anyone who loves God, that man is known by him. So that's 1 Corinthians, it's a quote. And Augustine adds to this. Well, note in this case that Paul did not say um, knows him, which would be a dangerous piece of presumption. Didn't anyone knows God, but is known by him. It's like another place in Galatians where as soon as Paul has said, but now knowing God, he corrects himself and says, or rather, being known by God. The object in the Christian life is not to know God, but to know that you are known by God. That's the basis on which you can step off and do anything. Um, that's the basis. And similarly, the object is not to know yourself, but know that yourself is known by God. I find that enormously liberating. You can just let go of all those self-help manuals at the door uh, and just try to orient oneself to God. Augustine does not know what God is in a string of attributes that he can delineate off one hand, like Locke or Hobbes. But after his conversion, he knows God as the one who has addressed him, the one who has called him by name, the one who has spoken to whom, and the one to whom he speaks, that is, he prays. Augustine's quest for self-knowledge, then, does not end in mathematical certainty, but in knowing that he is known by God. And, my friends, that's all we need, to. Thank you.
friends, we have, we have a minute for questions if you'd like to post some questions. And folks online, uh, you can type them in the chat box and they'll be sent forward to me and I can ask them uh, of Janet on your behalf. So if you have questions, now's the time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then trying to release mm -hmm. climate into life or to be by that. Mm -hmm. uh, the other one was uh, Ignatius, mm -hmm. who obviously went to war and loved um, all, all the, the pageantry that came with mm -hmm. that. And then again, just tell his life what was defined by that. Mm -hmm. No, that, that's good. I mean, there's two senses of materialism that are at play here, there's, and that we use in common parlance. There's the materialism, like, he's very materialistic, which is, that was something St. Francis, it, it's interesting, St. Francis, because you say um, he's coming from Assisi, uh, those Italian towns where the, that was where the origin of banking, the origin of modern capitalism is ar arguably happening there. You know, we, we're, we're grateful for the, the Tuscan Renaissance paintings and all that, but that was a boom, a lot of it from pillage of Constantinople, you know, um, uh, uh, that uh, a, a boom, and his father was uh, famously a cloth merchant. So St. Francis, in um, taking off all his clothes, throwing them down in the street, was, it was really um, a very considerable gesture to a father uh, who was a cloth merchant and about possessions, materiality. So that is this something that perhaps is different for us. And it's able, it's, we're able to be materialistic without wanting, you know, uh, a Lamborghini. I think just feeling we have to shop, um, you know, even if we're just going to Kmart or, or Target or something like that, the, to, the feeling well, stuff will make us happy. It's, it's the, rather the corollary of gluttony. There's the feeling. Um, and, you know, I, I think a lot of people are um, anxious shoppers like this. They feel a lack, and maybe it can be addressed by a new pair of espadrilles or, or whatever it is. Uh, so there's that kind of materialism, and it's related. But the materialism I was thinking, speaking about more that we see more in philosophical circles is the reductive materialism. There's nothing but. So the nothing buttery of things. So that human beings are only just... Um, uh, complex animals, they're, they're nothing but, they're um, nothing but that, and, and that thought is nothing but the firing of synapses, it's a delusion that we think we have free will, that kind of materialism. That, it's interesting that even the human societies are worried about that, because it's a real threat to human beings. What are human beings? You know, they're just some, as I say, random combination of parts that could be in, assembled in another way. So there's that kind of materialism as well. And um, I think what is marvelous, perhaps, uh, well, what I think I, I think is marvelous about uh, the doctrine of creation is we have it in, in Christianity and Judaism and Islam, and there are other variants of things in other, uh, other faith traditions, but not this creation ex nihilo, is what it enables is a full valuing of the material order. The material world is good, our bodies are good, that is the very center of Christian theology, the doctrine of the incarnation, the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. The physicality, our physicality is a good thing. You keep the goodness of physicality and understand that all of that is in the embrace of, of God at the same time. That our physicality doesn't make us far from God, but it's part of the way we are participate in God at every moment as God holds everything in being. So yes, that's the wider aspect of the better part of materialism. Yeah. I don't have the <coughs> philosophical or theological background or training to ask this question well, but 
At the Vancouver Art Gallery, it's probably still on, there is an exhibition called The Imitation Game, and it's about the history of artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. dating from about the time of Alan Turing and mm -hmm. going forward. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I'm just going to throw this into the pond and okay. see what happens. If you're going to ask these questions about the nature of God, mm -hmm. and somehow human beings have assembled their technology to start this process of artificial mm -hmm. intelligence, and some people fear that these artificially intelligent beings are going to become autonomous, mm -hmm. and now we're in big trouble. Mm. How does AI fit with all this theological thought that you've mm -hmm. given yeah. to us? Mm -hmm. Well, of course, <coughs> AI is still material. You're, you have to have some physical substructure if it's wires or just um, small electronic plates or, or whatever. I don't have the technical nails to answer this as I, I should, but it, that's all still material. Yeah, it isn't, it, um, it isn't spiritual, it's, it, it depends. And of course, I, 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 from what I've been reading, I think it's exaggerated the degree to which this could ever become autonomous because we still it will need people to create these things and put them together. And uh, so I, I think although it's, and obviously robots and other creations can do far more than we ever imagined. But it, it wouldn't uh, make a difference um, in terms of the materiality, because these are still material creations. Uh, they're, they're still a substrate of materiality, which is, from a Christian point of view, held in being by God. Um, and, uh, as to how far cyborgs will advance, that might be another story. Thank you. That, that's uh, thank you. An online question. John asks, if at the heart of Christian spirituality is the understanding that we are known by God, how do contemporary Christians avoid the self-indulgence of the focus on the self to the exclusion of others and indeed the whole creation? Mm -hmm. Well, I think this is, this is a life's project, but I think part of it will be a kind of, um, for all of us, and it, it's not something that happens individually, I think we need to think collectively uh, about what is it to, what is formation in virtue? What is formation in rightly di directed desire? Um, and that uh, is a very ancient path, and, and no one has ever said that you can't go wrong and you can't go astray plainly. We all can. But I think um, a start is to see that part of truly loving someone or something is to not possess them, to not control them, uh, to let them be, because they have their own dignity as a discreet person. I mean, this is something that most parents hopefully learn, some parents don't, that you have to love that child all the way along, but you have to know when to let go. You have to know when to let go. And so I, I think, um, um, this is, is perhaps an unselving. Iris Murdoch talks about this as a kind of unselving, and there are many ways we can experience this. Uh, I think we do experience this in loving and caring for other people. I've written about it. I think it's the experience often of parents with a young baby who is making these imperious demands. You know, it's often the first time those of us who are privileged in the privileged West, often the arrival of the first child is the first experience you have of some demands that are immediate, insistent, um, irrational, but entirely reasonable. Uh, and, and you're exhausted and you have to go on. And that kind of unsolving of putting uh, the other first, there, there are many ways in which we learn these lessons. Um, I, but I suppose it is, is a matter of learning that and reflecting about that. But it's a proper... I, I, what I, what I fear is sometimes Christians are taught they shouldn't love themselves at all. They should, they've got this idea of a truly virtuous person wouldn't think about themselves at all. But that's not the way, uh, or at least that Augustine's pointing to. Unless you have a proper love of yourself, you won't be able to love other people. That, so th that, it's keeping those things all in a balance. And for me, I think reflecting on the unity we have as creatures might be a a good step in the right direction. Oh, there's a question there. Hello. Yeah, thank you. Um, how does the reality that Christians see God as the crucified and risen one 
affect how we know that we are known by God. So what I'm hearing in Augustine's statement mm. is, mm. we know that we're known by God because he's infinite, vast, mm-hmm. immaterial, mm-hmm. immutable, boundless in power, mm-hmm. and the knowledge that he can bring to us. Mm-hmm. What happens when we go through the cross? Mm-hmm. Well, <clears throat> um, <coughs> in Christian teaching, the one who is in the cross is the word made flesh, the one in John's gospel, is the word incarnate, the one through whom all things were made. And that word is the same, I am, who addresses Moses from the burning bush. That I am <clears throat> is, is, is the one through whom all things are made, the Alpha and the Omega. And you'll realize that these, some of these names I gave you, the traditional names, the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega, Emmanuel, they are names in the Hebrew Bible for the God who speaks to Moses at the burning bush, Yahweh. But they are names in the New Testament for Christ. And that's not because there's two gods. There's only one God. There's only one God. And that God became incarnate and became a human being like us in every way but sin and died a death on the cross. And that intimacy of God, uh, God taking on our human condition, of course, the Christian theologians have talked about that, that, uh, that our human condition has been taken on by God in order so that in communion with God, participating in Christ, and different denominations do this differently, sacramentally, that we, become, we uh, become one with God, not as bits of God, but by, um, by being uh, made whole, by salus, by salvation. Um, we've attended in a modern, Western modernity to talk about salvation, <clears throat> And so it's just something that happens to us after we die. But the older meaning salus, it just comes from the Latin for health. And it meant to the wholeness that comes happens in this life, where we're already sharing, already orienting ourselves to the life in God, which we'll find also Christian teaching is its fulfillment in the life after death. So that uh, the, the incarnation of the word is not separate from God's act in creation. It is the new creation. It is it is continuous with God's act in creation. And um, it's partly why I'm so interested, I'm writing a book on the names of God, and it's partly why I'm so interested in all these names that are applied to Yahweh in the Hebrew Bible, are applied to Jesus in the New Testament. Read the book of Revelation, it's all the way through. The names Alpha and Omega, that's t- applied to God and to Jesus, the first and the last. This is the one from whom all things come and to whom all things go. And that, um, is affected by the incarnation, uh, life and death of Christ. And if it's, it's helpful, for instance, in thinking about miracles, um, <clears throat> so many, I think, uh, particularly in the 18th century, miracles began to be treated as just violations of the laws of nature. And Jesus was someone who could do violations of the laws of nature. But this is clearly not what's going on in the New Testament, because in the New Testament, there are a number of other wonder workers about the place, who could do odd things, um, but those were not the ones to follow. But the miracles of Jesus are all pointing to something. They're pointing to him being the Messiah, and they're pointing to him being the one, the first and the last creator. The one I, I particularly like in this regard is the stilling of the water, which doesn't seem particularly dramatic. You know, he, the disciples out in the boat, Jesus is asleep in the prow, storm comes up, and uh, um, the disciples, you know, wake up, you know, don't you see we're about to dry? And Jesus just, Jesus addresses the wind and the waves. He addresses the wind and the waves and they calm down. And then the disciples say, who is this that even the winds and the waves obey him? Well, that's already from the Psalter. And the answer is, the answer in the Psalter, it's a citation, is Yahweh. It's the Lord. It's the one who made them. So there you find Jesus acting, um, uh, in the power of the Creator. And indeed, all the divine titles that are given to Jesus in the New Testament are the divine titles that are given in the Hebrew Bible and in um, intertestamental Judaism. They're given to, to God in God's capacity as Creator. Because angels can do a lot of things in those days, but only God can create. So Jesus is, is not separate from the Creator God. He is one, and the cross is the new creation.
Hey, Jenna, it's uh, moving to hear you effectively preach in the city you were born in, right? <laughs> After all the cool places you've been in the meantime. Um, I am thinking about preaching, and it sounds to me like your Names of God book will be really helpful for those of us who stand and try and speak for God mm -hmm. week by week. Um, could you talk a little bit about the kind of preaching that would help us think about creator creature? And it, it sounds like the image of the choir chanting over the Marian couple yeah. with the names of God is, yeah. is perhaps a liturgical yeah. lens well, through which to think mm -hmm. about preaching. Um, well, I, I do, you know, I've become quite name obsessed, I must say. Uh, and uh, it's interesting that this, the names of God, of course, it's also a, a spiritual tradition in Islam, the 99 beautiful names of God. Um, and again, drawn classically in, in these traditions from the Holy Scriptures uh, um, uh, as well. But the names they have, I think what's interesting is that they aren't attributes. You can see how a name like omnipotent might be regarded as such, but a name like worm, you know, how, how is that um, um, an attribute of God? But it's just a, a way of, of embedding ourselves in the, the broader trajectory of the text of the Bible and the, as I see it, the kind of unfolding of the understanding of, um, of, of uh, the people of God. Um, God is named through God's mighty acts. God is named through what God does for the people. There are very few truly abstract gods, even the names, even the names that seem abstract are anchored in particular, uh, in particular accounts of God as creator or whatever but many of the names are anchored in precise incidents in the Hebrew Bible. And I think that provides a, a rich, rich texture um, for preaching and for Christian understanding without um, being biblicist in, in that flat kind of way, uh, understanding this is a sort of shared descriptive vocabulary. So that, that, that would be one thing that, that I would say. And I think um, it is liberating uh, to see how many classically in theology the, there's an enormous consensus that God can't be named. You know, my student, my um, daughters always uh, uh, upbraid me about this because I say, you're going on about the names of God and you're just going to say God can't be named. Well, yes, okay, that's it. But that's not really what my book is. And um, why can't God be named? And this is something that was arrived at the first century by a Jewish philosopher called Philo. Um, God can't be named because all our, all our language is appropriate to this space-time continuum. Um, all our language is, is uh, formulated by us in space-time continuum, and God is the creator of space and time. So it's, strictly speaking, inappropriate to God. So already Philo realizes this, and he already comes up with a solution that's interesting, which is that, well, fortunately, God has given us names by which we can name him. He, even back at the burning bush, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, God has named himself not as what God is in God's self, but who God is for us. So God addresses Moses, I am the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. I am the God of your ancestors. So we know who this God is because of who this God is for us. And of course, you can find that out in a number, in a number of ways. Um, but I, I think that would be one situation. I'm, I, I'd love to think that the world of preaching is actively awaiting my book. I'll have to finish it <laughs> and get back in touch with you at the time. Hi, Dr. Jenny. Um, I have a question. This, this coming week uh, lectionary reading is the story of good, the Good Samaritan. Ah, yes. Yeah, and of course the story is about uh, the lawyer asked Jesus about what else can I do? You mm -hmm. know, it's similar to you know, the, the world of self-obsessed people mm. <laughs> who mm -hmm. wants to keep asking, what else can I do? And mm. then, of course, Jesus answered with the story of the Good Samaritan mm -hmm. where the priest Levites passed the victim. Mm -hmm. But then um, Jesus then asked, uh, finally asked, if you are the victim in a way, uh, who's your neighbor? Mm -hmm. uh, and I think the pre-modern reading of the scripture uh, reads the Good Samaritan as Christ. Mm -hmm. and us as the victim, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. the modern reading, I think, <laughs> reads it as if we are we're supposed to be. Yes. The yes, victim, that's interesting. The good Samaritan. Mm -hmm. But um, 
I, I want to ask this question because the lawyer, the lawyer in this in this in this passage, asks, "What uh, what else can I do to inherit eternal life?" Mm -hmm. It seems to me that at the end of the day, human person's desire is eternal life, of course, and then following a thing in the. It's just that we don't know what is I eternal life. Yes, that's interesting. Mm. And, and in that case, um, the, the language of reorienting desire, it seems to me rather wrong because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, uh, I think it was <laughs> following David Bentley's heart, uh, David Bentley heart that says this, that it is impossible to desire anything without Im implicitly desire the source of all things. Mm -hmm. it, it seems to me that we all desire the sun. Yeah. We all sunflowers all desire yeah. the sun. Yeah. And heading towards the sun, but somehow, for some reason, we're just not, I don't know, strong enough, or the angle maybe is just not mm -hmm. <laughs> good enough. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. but it seems to me that there's, I don't know, it's just there's nothing to reorient. It's just that there's something to make it stronger. It, it's not that we don't this uh, it's not that we desire too little but I, uh, it's not that we desire too much things but i think it's because we desire too less yes that's very good point so, the sorry, not that we desire that? too little but we desire too, too 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 much but we desire too little and i think it's a corollary of it's not that we think too much of god but we have too small a conception of god uh, <clears throat> i remember being told uh, another theologian um, found himself sitting on a transatlantic flight next to a young man who is a physicist and uh, said, the, the young man said he, he used to believe in God uh, until he studied, knew, realized how complex the cosmos was and then he couldn't, couldn't believe in God anymore because the world was too complicated. Of course, the natural reaction is, well, what kind of God did he believe in? Not uh, too small a God, you know, probably this tin pot God. I mean, he, and, and of course, he had some imagination that's falling short of what God could be. Uh, if, uh, uh, similarly, I, I think this uh, same thing um, about, um, well, going back to your question about desiring, that we all desire solace, we all desire salvation, we desire well-being, we naturally desire that, but our, uh, we are the sunflowers that perhaps, as you say, are turned slightly in the wrong way. Uh, but, but it is, I, I think it is a natural way to to be, that we are, are all desiring, although we make grossly mistaken errors. I think you mentioned David Bentley Hart, didn't you? Are you thinking about his book on universalism in that book? Right. Yeah, yeah. So that is an orthodox theologian who's written a very interesting defense of universalism, which is the belief really that hell is empty, you know. And it's all based on, on in fact, some of that the initial essay for that came from a conference on creation at which both of us spoke. Um, and it's all based on creation ex nihilo and understanding the implications of that and that we all have our being from God and are oriented towards God. Now, um, there's some dispute. There have been universalists. Other people believe that since God is all that is and creates all that is, only the good, only the good is truly real. And so that if someone turned far enough away, if that sunflower turned far enough from, away from the sun, it would simply vanish. And the corollary of this in the doctrine of um, salvation would be that person would simply not be anymore, not that they'd burn eternally in hell, but they simply wouldn't be, um, uh, or they'd be much diminished. And that, that's the kind of theory you have. If you've ever read C.S. Lewis's The Great Divorce, that's in there. Um, but. Uh, Yes, but it, the, so Hart wants to make a strong argument for, for universalism because he simply says we, what we now know about ourselves, our communities, our biology, we're simply too interconnected to think that anyone would be lost. It's a very interesting book. Mm. Thank you. Uh, Janet, a question from online from Sandeep. He says, thank you, Dr. Soskis. Sos Sos mm -hmm. uh, Bonhoeffer's poem, yes. Who Am I, ends with whoever I am, Thou knowest, O God, I am thine. Bonhoeffer seems to suggest that who am I is also answered by whose I am. Could you comment on belonging to God? Yes, that's, uh, 
In fact, I, I was almost going to quote the Bonhoeffer poem at the end of this, a wonderful poem, Who Am I? But Jens Zimmerman was in the audience. I think Jens is gone. And he's written an absolutely wonderful article and a wonderful book on, uh, on uh, Bonhoeffer, and I didn't dare to cite it in his presence. But, uh, <laughs> but it is, if you haven't, you can just look up Who Am I, Bonhoeffer. And this is a wonderful poem that he wrote. Uh, Bonhoeffer, uh, as you probably know, was imprisoned for his plot in a resistance to Hitler. Bonhoeffer was quite a, a very elite Berlin family. And um, the who am I, uh, just a bit of it, who am I? They often tell me I would step from my cells to confinement calmly, cheerfully, firmly, like a squire from his country house. Who am I? They also tell me I would bear the day's misfortunes equably, smiling. Uh, or am I that, or am I only what I know myself to be, restless and longing and sick, like a bird in a cage struggling for breath? And he goes on, um, who am I? They mock me, these lonely questions of mine. Whoever I am now knowest, O God, I am thine. And that's the same point. This is precisely a very good statement in an extreme condition of knowing you are known by God. What Bonhoeffer can rest in there is knowing that he's known by God, even in the situation of extremists, because he knew he would be killed, and he was killed. Um, he knows he's known by God, and he knows he is loved by God as a creature. So that's very much, thank you, uh, online question, that's very much to the point. And, and uh, I think, again, uh, hopefully m many of us won't have that experience of extreme, but perhaps at the end of life, all of us will have that experience of extreme. It's uh, when, you, when you're stripped of all identifiers. I think this is something that's hard. Bonhoeffer wasn't a refugee, but this is something that's hardest for refugees, and we've seen it lately. I've thought about it with the Ukrainians and fleeing, and suddenly you're stripped you know, of, of everything or uh, um, and maybe you don't know, will you ever get your job back? Will you ever be able to finish your degree? Will you ever get your home back? Your whole source of identity, your community's broken up. I mean, that's a little bit of what Dante experienced and other uh, refugees experience, and, and that kind of experience. And it doesn't have to be that radical. It can be a point at which you know that you are known by God, uh, and importantly so. Mm. Friends, well, I want to say a word of thanks to you all for being here this evening for this lecture, and thank you very much, uh, Dr. Saskas, for your presentation and for uh, leaving us on this note of uh, being known by God. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, and again to the church and the benefactor, it's a really a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. Yeah.